Good morning and welcome to our monthly webcast. I am Samir Mehta, your moderator. This is session number 30 and number 16 since our partnership with theheart.org. We have another uh, interesting and uh, genuinely complex coronary intervention case for you today. I would also like to welcome the numerous interventional cardiology fellows who have a part of the curriculum in Beijing, China, as well as the VA hospital in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Beijing, from what I can see, is 9 in the evening, uh, a little beyond your dinner time, but hopefully you'll find this a very useful uh, uh, academic case. Uh, Without any further delay, let me take you to the cardiac cath lab where Dr. Kinney and Dr. Sharma are about ready with the uh, with today's case. Samin, good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to Anu. I, I believe she's had a promotion and she's the new director of the cardiac cath lab. Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, that was long due. She has been working um, uh, as a full, uh, the, you know, in that capacity being associate director and now well-deserved title. So she received this uh, announcement was made last week and uh, I really, uh, you know, thankful to her uh, that uh, her controlling the cath lab and uh, managing cath lab, I was able to do all my outreach and networking. And that networking is the way of the future. As you're saying that Beijing and uh, Puerto Rico and so, that uh, no longer it's, a, uh, there is no boundaries for anything, whether it's a patient or it's a teaching. And that is what we have established in both, uh, whether clinical or by the webcast uh, all over the world. Anu, congratulations. I know it has been so many years of hard work, and I, I meet with your fellows all over the world, and they express their profound gratitude to what you have taught them. Perfect. Now, we actually have a very interesting case, uh, and we are ready to start. Uh, if uh, I can just introduce uh, the, uh, all uh, you know, our team, and I, as you see, the time to time we get our, another guest, uh, uh, the interventionist, actually it's not guest, it's a part of our team, Roxana Maran, and uh, with the fellows here, they're knowing that the, one of the topics I'll be talking today is the contrast-induced nephropathy, and uh, of course, uh, she being a master, and with the Maran classification of the risk factor of the CIN, I felt uh, uh, that it is very imperative that we take her opinion uh, in many of the statements which are not clear-cut and I will be making uh, during this uh, our morning uh, webcast presentation. Good now, morning, with that, Roxana, and welcome. Good morning, uh, Shamir. It's, uh, it's wonderful to, to be here as part of this, and I personally want to congratulate both Dr. Sharma and Dr. Kinney for their incredible promotion, and they've been leaders in the field. And as you know, Dr. Sharma is my first uh, teacher in interventional cardiology. He trained me in angioplasty, so I have a a deep devotion to both these folks, so it's wonderful to be here. Okay, now let's get to our, uh, because this is a case which will require a lot of technical help and uh, work uh, while we present the case and uh, go, if we go to the slide, uh, this is our case number 16 uh, with the patient presented on uh, October 21st with progressive dyspnea and chest pain at rest and uh, shortness of breath ruled out for MI by the other hospital okay. transferred here and cath revealed three vessel disease and normal EF. Patient had a stent in the mid LED in the past, uh, but uh, on the transfer found to have significant uh, new lesion in the distal LED, which underwent uh, promus DES and did good. Uh, patient actually, these are the risk factors, also CVA, which complicates uh, with the AFib that need to be on dual antiplatelet therapy. And also patient has chronic renal insufficiency with creatinine clearance of uh, 38. So it makes that um, the chronic kidney disease uh, is stage uh, four. So clearly that is one of the big issues nowadays with elderly patients with their impaired renal function that what we do and what the guidelines tells us to do, is there any particular way to prevent and manage these patients? Now one issue comes that once you need dual antiplatelet therapy after DES and patient needs long-term anticoagulation, be it uh, uh, the warfarin or uh, pradaxa, the question comes, what you do with the dual antiplatelet therapy? We actually have published that uh, com combination of dual antiplatelet with ADP receptor being given every other day seems to have a good efficacy and less bleeding because we know you can give all three agents, that will create a problem. Now, as far as the CAD is concerned, which is just going to show, the question today will be the right coronary artery, uh, which has multiple calcific lesion, uh, and uh, syntax score were 
29. So, if we put into our appropriateness risk, which clearly has become to the highlight, although this patient did not have any functional study, but based on the three vessel disease and symptoms, will appropriate uh, the green bar. Now, uh, Anu, you can take us through the angiogram now. Yeah, so if you see uh, the left side, left main uh, is non obstructive. And uh, what she had was a stent done in an outside hospital. So Anu, then she came back with the no, angiogram has not come yet. We just need you to pause one moment. Uh, yes, yeah, we have sure. it now. Go ahead. Okay. Please. So if you see there, you have a non-obstructive left main, and a prox LED again mild disease. So when she presented to us, uh, she actually uh, already had an intervention of the LED before, but she had new lesion in the distal LED, which is where we did a stent. Now, in the circ, there is a you know, high lateral which is moderate size, but there is a 60 70 percent lesion in the prox circ, but a small size OM which is uh, totally occluded. And this is uh, the cranial shot with LAD. After the two diagonals, the stent uh, that uh, was done uh, here looks okay. This is our LV function near normal. And this is our RCA. If you see calcified osteal disease and a lot of damping, her blood pressure usually runs at 140 or so. As soon as we engage, the pressure goes down to less than 100. The prox uh, RCA itself is non obstructive, but as you see, the distal, there is actually a stent. Stent is okay, but further down, there is another 60 70 percent uh, disease. And more important is after the PDA, if you see the AV continuation RPL, again calcified and uh, multiple lesions in the uh, AV continuation RPL area. Therefore, challenge wise with the technical that how are you going to manage this, um, that uh, one of the biggest issue comes that what guide uh, engagement in this osteo lesion. I think that is yeah. one of the very important issue knowing that the, you can use some aggressive guides for the distal lesion, but she has very complicated uh, distal and AV continuation lesion. We need to do all in order to supply downstream. So, whenever there is osteal disease, the common teaching is to try not to use an aggressive guide. Just with the engagement, uh, we may cause, uh, you know, dissection of the vessels. Uh, we have seen spiral dissection of the RCA using uh, uh, the Amplat guides. So, in this situation, since we have to take care of the distal uh, vessel, I think we can go to a guide which is in between you. The FR probably will not give us any support. If it is just we were going to do the osteal, Maybe just an FR guide would have been good enough, but here, since we need some support distally, better to go with the Lima guide. The other guide, the suggestions still are that you could still go with an uh, Amplats uh, guide, but you have to be very careful when you are doing uh, the osteal lesion. So, best we, I think we have selected a uh, Lima guide. Now, then, in some situation, you could do that if you are, you think that a distal delivery is a problem, that you can treat just the osteum, put the stent. And then, so that makes it easier to use some more aggressive guides, no? Anu, Lima guide with side holes 7 French or 6 French? We have a 7 French uh, guide uh, here. Since cal there is calcium and uh, we are planning to do rotational atherectomy and if we have to go up with the bur size, that is the only reason we go with, gone with the 7 French. If uh, it was a non-calcific vessel, we could have done with the 6 French uh, um, guide. And then, of course, um, you know, taking care of the ostium would be okay, but the delivery of the stent in the distal RCA and in the AV continuation RPL uh, could be, a pro, uh, you know, that is where we probably are going to have a challenge, whether we are going to use uh, uh, the double wire technique or we may be uh, needing some uh, newer uh, device uh, help in this situation once you have done the rotational atherectomy. And particularly, um, uh, what is you have been using, and we have shown that demonstration. Uh, yeah, we saw the, the guideliner that we have been using uh, often uh, in this situation. That once you have done, uh, done the debulking uh, with a single wire, you can use the guideliner. Usually, that helps. Uh, you know, it's like extension of the guide um, that you extend it all the way, almost from prom to the mid RCA. Then you'll be able to deliver the strength through that uh, very easily. Very good. Now, what we'll do, now tell us what you start because then I'll take my 10 minutes uh, for a slide presentation so that uh, you tell how you are going to do and uh, we go off uh, to our uh, presentation. Now, since it is a um, osteal right and a complex right, we do with an elderly patient. We, as you see here, we do have a temporary wire. Uh, 
because we are going to do rotational arthrectomy, a 7 French guide and a long sheath so that we will get a good support with the Lima guide we will engage and then um, since we have to plan is to take care all the way the distal lesion AV continuation RPL, we are going to use a over the wire system. So, we have a fine cross fielder, so we are going to cross then uh, exchange it to the rotor wire and distal vessel we are talking about a 275 between 25 to 275. So, the distal rotational arthrectomy will be done with 1.5 bar. Also, what will be challenging here is uh, the rotor bar is not going to reach to the distal RCA. So, once we do the rotational arthrectomy of the osteal RCA, we will have to use Dynaglide to get the bar down to the distal RCA and AV continuation. What if you just go with the 1.75 bar? I think the, you could uh, get it. Yeah, I think we should try 1.75. Maybe it will uh, be one single bar. Could be. Because I do not know whether AV continuation you need a rota. See, there is not that calcium. Calcium is in the ostium and the distal RCA. So, that many times that uh, it does not have to be a clear cut that you need to do all the cases with a rotation arthrectomy. You do only lesions which are calcific and others you can just do a PTCA. But uh, clearly the wire movement any time when you are advancing the wire and crossing the lesion will give you a, a idea that uh, how calcific and stiff that lesion is. Well, that will first of all uh, make the case uh, far more simpler than uh, trying to do the distal lesion which I think will be a challenge with both the uh, 1.5 or the 1.75. Uh, Anu, excellent strategy, excellent uh, technical tips uh, to, to watch out for the things uh, which could uh, uh, go wrong. Uh, Samin, uh, what do you have with your uh, uh, academic uh, teaching points for the case uh, for uh, for uh, people to understand. Yes. Uh, yeah. The will start with the uh, those two points as we always try to uh, pick uh, pertaining to the case and those being that new stent design, the third generation. Actually, no longer we are in second. We are the third generation era and the choice of contrast media to reduce uh, acute kidney injury or we used to call contrast induced nephropathy. So, the basically third generation, what is happening is that just to give overall view that we are going to the thinner struts, you continue, your thinner struts and uh, uh, the thinner struts and basically the polymer which is the bioabsorbable or very thin polymer. That is where we are. Now, whether it will be bioabsorbable stent is a different story, but those are the two important development and these are the three new stents which are available or soon will be available. Zions Prime was the first one to come with the Abbott, then Resolute of Medtronic is with the FDA, hopefully we will hear it very soon, which is on addition to uh, our already endeavor and then the Promus Element with the Boston Scientific, uh, which is the Platinum Chromium uh, and uh, the same Everlimus drug. And basically these are the very strength patterns. The key remains is that as we strength thickness has really gone down to a very small 0 0.0032 inch and uh, the drug which seems to be most effective ever lumus has been used and uh, the, the polymer thickness actually has decreased. Now these are uh, basically some uh, slides just to show that the thin strand strut coverage uh, is the way to go at present and this platinum chromium has shown to provide radial strength. Remember cobalt chromium has been criticized to issues in terms of the radial strength that it is a recoil and you cannot extend the calcific lesion. Clearly, it is more radio opaque as well as flexible and uh, at the same time providing radial strength. And I would say there is some basis to it besides the bench testing that how can we say this radial strength issue. The second issue as I mentioned with the recoil shown in this slide comparatively and conformability very important because the, that how the stent conforms to the vessel uh, the diameter the basically or angle that you put into the RCA it takes the shape of the RCA and clearly the lower the number better it is and you can see the promus element really on the far right side in terms of this conformability uh, indexes. Now then is the fracture resistant you know stents always have an issue in terms of the fracture resistance uh, and uh, the fractures particularly thin uh, stents have been uh, shown or in uh, inelastic uh, uh, the stent situation has been an issue so that uh, the, uh, the platinum chromium uh, comes uh, with this uh, additional advantage. Now then this is a very important sub study which was done uh, in the platinum and that basically is that about we know when you put a stent 
about 6% of them you have incomplete stent opposition, we call ISA. Now what happens at follow up? It has been shown that some of them disappear, some of them develop more acquired late opposition and of course that is higher with the patients with the have acute coronary syndrome. And very interesting with the platinum QCA and IVAS study showed that what you left uh, at time zero, incomplete stent opposition at follow up disappears. Now you say how can that happen? I think this really speaks for the radial strength and the stent continues to expand so that at follow up you do not have a stent opposition and of course we need f few more studies to answer that. Then biggest question comes where exactly is the stent in terms of the marker and this is actually a very illustrative slide which shows where the Zion's prime, where the promus element and so and looks like that Zion's prime and so your stent is at the middle of the marker. The wherever that last that one millimeter marker, most of the stents are at the middle of the marker, but promus is inside the marker. And of course, the issue remain is the uh, distal overhang, which is much smaller with the promus, and also has been shown that it is a more non-compliant balloon. So same thing like a cipher we used to deploy 16, 18 atmosphere is a routine will become routine practice in my opinion with the platinum chromium stent. And uh, we know the we already have been we used actually iron with the Packley taxel of the platinum chromium and of course the promus element is the one which we will be using uh, today and uh, the, some data I will show and lastly this will be available as a BMS also by name of omega stent and there is a new stent will be available in this abluminal coating. Now platinum many trials most important being our workhorse uh, randomized clinical trial which was non-inferiority to uh, existing cobalt chromium everluminous eluting stent and basically came Numerically, about 0.5% event was higher, but this was within the non-inferiority and therefore identical primary endpoint uh, met in the platinum trial. Maybe I can ask uh, Roxana on this issue that we talk a lot of the non-inferiority that as an interventionist, what do we understand uh, from uh, the statistical point when we're talking non-inferiority, although stent was 0.5% inferior uh, compared to cobalt chromium. According, I mean, statistically speaking, when you look at this and when as long as you are within the bounds of the upper bounds of the non-inferiority margin, you can claim non-inferiority. That's, that's the way you plan the, uh, uh, the study. So the fact that it's a little bit, looks like it's a little bit uh, performing a little bit less than the control stand doesn't really mean anything statistically as long as you meet it within the non-inferiority bound. And I know that a lot of people would look at that and say, but I think if you, the way it is statistically, that if you actually had twice as many patients, that you'd most likely move towards equivalence or go, go backwards towards, so that you would no longer show that. And that's really kind of the, the way you have to think about this when you're looking at uh, statistical uh, bound, bounds. Okay, now, I know you want to show anything about the guiding? Okay. Uh, then, the, basically, the one year outcome, as you can see, identical. That's ditto. You know, all these patients, about 1,500 patients, whether you take a major endpoint of the death, MI, TVR, stent thrombosis, absolutely on top, uh, the, the few percent point which came out a difference was just basically uh, related to uh, your, our target uh, lesion revascularization, but 0.5%. Now, the issue had been with the polymer, as I mentioned, that uh, more and more we are going away with the polymer because of the degradation, polymer uh, coating, and so and so forth, so that science and field is going away from this DS free polymer and in this uh, with the uh, platinum chromium is the synergy stent which will have only abluminal bioabsorbable polymer that which is basically uh, showing towards the lumen and uh, the basically on the sorry away from the lumen so that's where your intimal hyperplasia occurs because of the injury and uh, hopefully that will require less duration or shorter duration of antiplatelet therapy uh, therapy in these patients, but the uh, abluminal bioabsorbable polymer has been studied by others, other some compound and some trials, but uh, they still need to be, concept still need to be proven that will it be effective. But clearly, as I mentioned, the polymer is taking a lower and lower and of course now the bioabsorbable stands. Now then, question, what is the other comparison? We knew <coughs> the, that Endeavor versus Resolute DES, one year data, again, were identical uh, the, the, with the Zion's V except the stent thrombosis was the definite stent thrombosis was higher with the Resolute versus with the Zion's uh, 1.2 uh, versus 0.3. And then they presented a 24 months data in Lancet uh, two months ago showing that again 
identical performance of two stents yes there was a the trend towards higher the stent thrombosis is definite and probable with the resolute compared to zion so that basically if you compare second generation stent versus third generation stent it basically comes out to be the same level uh, overall at present because this still will i'll call it a second generation uh, and only uh, the for the third generation stent uh, the data was from the platinum as i showed you uh, then the issue second issue comes is the choice of the contrast media to reduce the acute kidney injury and these are the contrast media classification based on their osmolarity ionicity and of course uh, the various monomer or dimers and uh, compounds which have been shown including their viscosity the basically what we have seen is that we have gone away from the ionic to the non ionic and from hyper osmolar to the uh, low osmolar contrast or whether it should be iso osmolar which is our blood viscosity of 200 uh, milli osmol now why it is issue because acute kidney injury caused by the contrast is uh, uh, harmful which have been shown short and long term and we know it takes 2 to 3 days so that you need to follow these patients they longer now various mechanism for contrast nephropathy i think the most important in my opinion is the decrease of the blood flow and redistribution of the blood flow uh, from uh, medulla to cortex and of course uh, uh, the direct injury of the contrast material and the free radical scavenger uh, is the region now of the various factors the non modifiable modifiable i put it in this slide uh, and uh, important being from which is our concern today is the contrast ionic versus high osmolar uh, th those are associated with higher contrast induced uh, uh, nephropathy now then the what about the non ionic and low osmolar there are many trials have done to answer that question with the high oxal uh, non ionic versus ionic agent and seems to be that non ionic in the early studies shown lower as long as the low osmolar contrast so basically it field has moved completely particularly the patient i would not even say in the cin patient i think interventional cardiology nobody uses high osmolar contrast at point at one point there issue you the cost but there is no longer the cost issue because all these agents have become quite uh, cheaper then question is is there a difference into individual no, low osmolar and or iso osmolar contrast and of course uh, some studies with the iodexinol and iopamidol as you can see on the right side clearly again no difference in contrast nephropathy then uh, uh, roxana did this trial of the icon compare ioxalate with iodexinol again no difference in the overall incidence and then there were two studies and that really with this field opened up based on the iodexinol and iohexol uh, iso osmolar and low osmolar in the nephric study showing lower is the uh, lower cin be on the iodexinol group uh, uh, i compared to iohexal iohexal is our omnipeg and that really opened the field that probably iodexinol is a better agent particularly patient with a diabetic uh, patients and so and we actually published our meta analysis of the published randomized trials and we found no difference in iodexinol and iopamidol so that clearly the field was open in order to really prove that hypothesis that what was seen in the nephric trial that was it true and that led to the major randomized trial of the care one of the largest randomized trial of the uh, patients with the, with the uh, renal insufficiency of the 480 patients and this was published 3 uh, uh, years ago that comparing iopamidol and iodexinol you can see numerically that in all categories no matter what you have the definition of contrast induced nephropathy or aki that it's lower in iopamidol versus iodexinol group once you go to the individual subgroups of the diabetics nstyle cysteine and so that clearly that you start seeing some trend not again clear cut but trend towards a lower incidence of contrast nephropathy with the iopamidol compared to iodexinol so the basically that concept which was seen by nephric you can see that the diabetic patients were in the trial in the care were more than what were in the nephric trial and we did not see that uh, even a signal of what was seen in the nephric study now uh, maybe uh, roxana you can comment on this uh, point at this time you know given the care trial being the largest trial comparing contrast media i think with the, there is a a clear feeling uh, amongst everyone given the data that amongst the low osmolar compounds certainly iodexinol is not superior and and that was all driven by a single trial the nephric trial that and actually uh you know the iodexinol made it on the on some of the guidelines and the previous guidelines and i think the new 
PCI guidelines, which I know you're going to discuss, really do not give a choice of a contrast media. And I think the more, more important things for us is not to focus so much that the isoosmolar compound is going to reduce contrast-induced nephropathy or contrast-induced acute kidney injury, rather, but to really think about the risk factors of the patients and some of the things surrounding the procedure to try to decrease the volume, and I know you're going to talk about that. So this trial really was the, the largest trial looking at the contrast media and really kind of putting to bed the, uh, the superiority of, let's say, an isoosmolar compound. I think, importantly, iodixanol, while it, it has a lowest osmolality, and you would think if os osmolality matters, it has the highest viscosity. So there are some prices to be paid back, and, I, at, and at the moment, you really can't say that one is better than the other. Perfect. Now then, the most important issue was that is it the CIN or is it the contrast? And this is actually, we had a one-year follow-up of the CARE trial. We brought those patients back and defined major adverse event of the death, stroke, MI and end stage renal disease requiring dialysis and remaining being the other event. And basically what did we find? That patients actually also we did a 16 measurement which seems to be a better marker of uh, acute kidney injury compared to others. Wait two minutes will be done. Uh, that uh, that uh, of the kidney injury and basically confirm the finding that yes once you have an increase in creatinine or cysteine there is a higher incidence of major adverse event at one year. Now, more important for us was that is there a drug interaction? And you can see here, compared to iopamidol and iodixinol, that uh, in patients with the iodixinol had a higher odd ratio of developing major event at one year. And uh, actually, it's a three times higher if you compare. Uh, we've taken all the patients uh, together that in the care trial at one year follow-up, three times higher major adverse event with the iodixinol compared to iopamidol. Then the last issue was that is the patient, uh, the outcome are based on the contrast nephropathy, these patients who have high serum creatinine. And this is a very, very Ill interesting slide. That basically means if you take a patient with iopamidol with a CIN as a reference, if you did not develop CIN, your major adverse event is low. Now if you develop CIN with the iodixinol, your hazard ratio becomes almost 2.9 means three times. And if you did not develop CIN, remains one. So basically it speaks for that clearly it's the CIN which really uh, all the risk factors together, if you come uh, basically control for it, that's the CIN and particularly in the trial, we're using iodixinol was associated with adverse long-term outcome. And of course, this has been shown by many other studies and so. Uh, therefore, this goes back to the guidelines uh, very simply, quickly. The back in, as uh, uh, Dr. Mehran uh, pointed out, that back in 2006, 2005 and 7, I saw a smaller contrast agent was preferred. But clearly, since that data, CARE was such a major randomized trial, the guidelines were changed that no longer it, they put into the low or smaller contrast media other than IOXylate or IOHAXL. Because clearly, the Omnipeg IOHAXL was associated with higher contrast induced nephropathy. So that was removed. Uh, that, that was only labeled as a bad agent, but everything else. Now, then it led to a subsequent because more data came and the field kind of became very muddy that there was no one superior agent. So that basically in the latest guidelines of the acute coronary syndrome earlier this year and the re recent uh, PCI guidelines actually do not make a point of any uh, contrast material. They do emphasize that you need to risk stratify these patients and most important is hydration, hydration, hydration and patient with kidney uh, renal dysfunction, you decrease the contrast volume. And then basically this is where it is that since the field is not very clear, it is tough to make any recommendation. Although I can tell you, based on the care trial and some data, you could make it a point, but clearly for the committee, it was not clear that, uh, that we, they can come up with a one single agent which, as a preferred agent. Yeah. Roxana, you want to make a comment yeah, on that? So my last, I mean, I think that this whole field of acute kidney injury is really opening up a lot of doors for us to really understand what's the... What's the, the real outcome? Is it really the acute kidney injury or is it about the patient who's at so much higher risk for developing this acute kidney injury? And what can we do to, to actually reduce these complications? Certainly, we, we just heard from Dr. Sharma that the type of contrast media, you really, obviously, low osmolar, but amongst the low osmolar compounds, uh, you know, uh, uh, certainly between... Um, 
uh, iodixanol or iohexol, you can't really make a, a specific choice, although the CARE trial really shows you actually the other way around. But certainly, the more important piece is in assessment of the patient's risk. And I think these biomarkers like cystatin C, as you discussed with the CARE study, and GAL are going to really, really come into play in finding that high-risk patient individual. It, there are many, many clinical trials ongoing, and we're going to lead a, a clinical trial called Renal Guard. It really does have a lot to do with the hydration status of the patient, using the concept of keeping the kidney well hydrated and really keeping that urine output going. And we're going to look at that in a one-to-one -one randomized fashion using the renal guard system with a sy systematic hydration and, and diuresis of the patient. We're really doing everything we can to reduce this important complication. Finally, I think in order to really put this to bed, it's important for us to do a very, very large study where we reduce contrast-induced acute kidney injury, but really show that by reducing that, we've actually reduced mortality and permanent renal damage. And that's a clinical trial that we're designing and hoping to, to do. And we're, we're thinking that this really should be one of the important, uh, important fo focuses of the, of the future. Perfect. Now, Arno, Roxana, we are back to you now. Yeah, Roxana, excellent review. Samin, in the meantime, uh, as uh, I'm sure uh, you're going to start showing where Anu has reached, there is an important question which has come from, uh, uh, this is a question from Dr. Anshul Jain from uh, Sri Action Balaji Hospital. Uh, it's, it's a hospital in New Delhi. They do great work. His question is, is there any merit in using extra support rotavir uh, for these cases where uh, support is going to be an issue? Okay, Anshul. Trained by us, um, so I think if you can see here, we I did say the guide selection wise we go to uh, Lima guide, but uh, if you can show the angiograms there, see how the takeoff of the RCA is uh, anterior and uh, almost uh, shepherd group, not complete shepherd group takeoff. So I uh, the Lima hook was uh, longer than what we expected, was not the best uh, guide uh, at all in this situation. You can actually use what is called as a no torque, uh, uh, you know, guide in this uh, case. But what I did was uh, took a, the uh, seven French uh, FR guide. See the way you place it. You place it in the ostium, and then take your. You have your fine cross and and any kind of uh, your uh, uh, workhorse wire. Of ideally, if you can have a glide wire that is available. This is a fielder that you, you are able to engage, means wire the vessel with your guide sitting in the ostium so it exactly floats and then you wire the entire vessel, then get your uh, fine cross. So now you know, you then negotiate your change your rotation, uh, rotate your uh, guide catheter so that you can now get to the ostium and engage uh, the RCA, uh, then exchange it to the rotavire. Good. Okay. Now we are ready. Yeah. Okay, now that has been done. Now question comes is that extra support versus, uh, yes, this is a kind of case, the extra support will help you uh, in uh, doing a rotation of threctomy. Sure. So, yeah, now so this is a 1.75 burn yeah, and wire is distally. Yeah. Wire is distal yeah. and is the and same thing. Since okay. our goal is to use uh, the, we have to do the ostial right, uh, what we have to do in this situation is keep the guide in the ostium. You start your rotation of threctomy in the guide so that you actually burr the ostium. Yeah. You may little burr a little bit of the tip of the guide. That's all right. Yeah. 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 See, the burr will jump. Yeah, it's a 1.75 burr. It will jump, but that's okay. You come back again and try to uh, ablate that ostial um, area once again. How much are point. you concerned that the guiding catheter isn't uh, coaxial there? Yeah, that's okay. That's the key. Uh, that uh, clearly that uh, this is where that extra support wire will help you. Like in this particular case, that uh, your guide is, uh, as long as it's aligned, that's okay. Because the bar, the bar will go. Now, sometimes the bar may give a little trouble. That in that case, you need to just bring the dianaglide. No, one of the, question, yeah. one yeah. of the right. questions which has right. come through is, uh, I do not have rotational yeah. atherectomy. Could this yeah. case be done with the cutting balloon? Well, I would say osteal probably, but look at the distal calcium on the distal um, RCA. That will be very one. That is applies to any calcific lesion. No, guide. Yeah. 
another question which has come up but yes the let, i would i want to some yeah good point let's try yeah i would say that not a second yeah that uh, the answer to that is that it is possible but will be difficult it's not impossible you don't need to send this case for surgery if you think uh, uh, that uh, you don't have rotation arthrectomy because this is a kind of case you can still as you can see that wire comes back so that you advance the wire with the break release that uh, the ideally as i said the rotation arthrectomy purpose of the rotation arthrectomy is that to make a complex case simple and this is the ivas you do it will be a circular uh, 360 degree arc of calcium and rotation arthrectomy will make your uh, uh, the process simpler although it has not been shown some studies have shown yes lower acute complication but even the latest rotex trial did not show any benefit of rotation arthrectomy so that issue still remains but in my opinion these kind of cases will decrease your overall stent use uh, and you will have a better expansion of the stent but again it's a uh, not proven by only on any randomized unit little distal or no, no we done yeah. uh, so you saw how we got our uh, bur uh, so once we did the ostium to go to the All distal the rca what you have to do is you have to do the dyna glide so that you can get a push a little bit of your uh, bar to the proximal rca in which, uh, in which situation you go on the dyna glide and your assistant actually has to do the break release so then you manually advance the guide uh, from your uh, y connector i know that was a very One useful uh, demonstration uh, uh. yeah as you see that the guide is still remains a right. little okay that's all right as long as your your the wire is enough and you keep moving the wire distally no. well, also some very simple things like the use of an almost ap cranial view to demonstrate uh, the distal uh, vessel okay. very nicely samin uh, question has come for you is there any age cut off you use for a drug eluting stent okay um i'm sorry say any age cut off you use for using a drug eluting stent well i mean i would say the two different things actually very very interesting question just came up and i'll tell you why i had a patient for the tavi workup uh, yesterday uh, actually on monday um, uh, i sorry i'm um, the friday a uh, 92 year old otherwise very healthy normal normal activity he hasn't gone to too many doctors and of course found to have little shortness of breath and severe aortic stenosis it's a good 92 a uh, patient had a bypass surgery actually 15 years ago and uh, the the grafts uh, to the lima was good and the sir graft is closed now she has a very complex distal left main circumflex graft lesion which if you put a bare metal stent will have a 50% restenosis in the 6 month then question was if you need to do tavi you have to delay the 6 uh, month uh, your tavi procedure but if you put a bms will become more difficult to manage so in that particular case despite knowing will be tavi and despite knowing uh, that uh, this patient 92 year old we put a drug looting stent therefore coming back to the point i think i it's a more important is the overall patient's uh, uh, condition uh, irrespective of the age yes we try to put a, a bms in the older age uh, idea is to the short term antiplatelet therapy but more and more we know that almost 6 months is required because the ba based on the zions we usa registry that stent thrombosis after 6 months is almost negligible just like what we used to have with the bare metal stent after 2 weeks very rare so that with the des uh, with the current generation des of zions and so that you have a low very low stent thrombosis after 6 months so that i my goal is basically is that yes if patient has uh, we are doing it incidental not for the patient's quality clearly there is we are not doing it here improving the life in these elderly patients from the quality if the patient's issue is that otherwise patient is viable it's better to put a des and give a 6 months of antiplatelet therapy you don't have to give it for one year 81 mg of uh, uh, aspirin and uh, clopidogrel or uh, the you know now of course you can use the ticagrelor or although we don't have much experience there yet but those will be the uh, choice of antiplatelet therapy in the elderly and i will make a decision of the des in that case Last yeah. angiogram, yeah. you, uh, yeah. you took the the ostium looks good. Yep. Ostium now, um, tell what you are doing now. Which wire? I have a run through wire which I am wiring side by side into the AV continuation RPL. I think uh, elderly patients also very important as long as you know they don't have any bleeding uh, problems. Uh, you know that they don't have had a prior CVA, no bleeding. Uh, 
issues and there is a family member who will take care of the patient and make sure that uh, antiplatelet therapy is given uh, regularly, there should be no age cutoff. Also what happens is this elderly patient calcific vessels, there is no point to doing a very complex case and uh, uh, bare metal strength and they come back with restenosis. The serum creatinine was uh, uh, 38. Yeah. The creatinine clearance was 38. 38. What, yeah. is, no. what is the creatinine today? 1.4. Last time it was 1.8. Yeah. So, by valerodin here, what are you using? Yeah, the yeah by valerodin is the agent um, in all our cases uh, which are uh, uh, routinely being used, and of course, uh, the bolus uh, is adjusted based on the creatinine clearance. But, uh, but that's a uh, that has been our preferred uh, agent all and of yeah. course patient what 2520 yeah so now it's a 2.520 um, the for the distal the, segment yeah, the distal. quantum apex high pressure so mean another question for you why did you choose 6 weeks mm. uh, post lad pci and uh, what is the normal time you're using for a stage pci yeah usually actually anywhere between uh, 5 uh, weeks plus and uh, uh, although, as you know, that new guidelines, uh, sorry, our uh, recommendation point of view, that stage intervention, if you define at time zero, will still be a billable uh, activity as of 2012, but your, un, uh, your admission, unanticipated admission of the 30-day may not be billable anymore, uh, so that uh, the usually we're still giving it a I five weeks. I think we need a regular balloon. It's not going this time. Huh? We need a uh, non-compliant. No, it's not there. Give some time. Okay. Yeah, that uh, basically doing it for after, uh, um, See? Yeah, go a little further, yeah, no, we'll go. Uh, that after uh, uh, the five weeks is our usual, and in this particular case, uh, we made it a little longer, and largely because of this uh, very complex, because uh, we have been, uh, you know, few requests uh, for osteal RCA, because a lot of uh, people do mm. get osteal RCA. You want to change it? Or we can dilate. Go, and go, see go. further. It's not that you yeah. need a little bit. Yeah. You yeah, know, the distal end, few millimeter now also, the point remains is that if you may not have gone completely, but uh, if you, as long as the nose of the balloon is in the lesion, you can dilate and uh, many times your rest of the balloon will move in. There, it's a two point, um, uh, the 2.520 qu quantum apex uh, non-compliant. Now, whether you should use a compliant balloon and get a, a 2.5 uh, 20 apex, uh, we'll see. Yeah, I think it's a, as you can see that uh, she's making this jiggling motion. Give me a. Yeah. Okay, that less dial a distal area. This is yeah. exactly yeah. what uh, Anu had mentioned would be the issue that huh? will come up. Okay. A little further. Move. Samin, a very five. interesting Point question for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody has asked uh, what is yeah. happening to the PCI volume at Mount Sinai and uh, did you register a decrease for the year? Yeah, well actually we definitely will have a decrease. The question is how much decrease, that's the issue. Overall in the country as you uh, probably know and we know from the New York State being on the Department of Health uh, that they, we expect the highest, you want to ask him? Uh, that we expect the highest decline this year even beyond what happened in 2006 after the courage trial. Remember courage countrywide was about 16-17% decline. But it is expected because of appropriateness and lot of media issues and controversy of the stents. And I can tell you many of the cases, they are appropriate but people are uh, concerned to do those uh, stents nowadays so that there is, it is expected that it will be about 25% decline this year. Now having said that, that Sinai will have a decline and uh, part of that is this uh, most of the decline has been averted because of our outreach and uh, networking activities. So that I think we'll have probably a few percentage. And hopefully by next uh, month's uh, webcast, I'll give you the exact number. But yes, decline is there now. On the contrary, just want to say, the cath volume is increased. The, and that is, speaks for the system process, that uh, appropriateness that, yes, you are doing more cath, your patients are being, but clearly those patients who are routinely getting the PCI in the past are not getting the PCI now for right and appropriate reasons. Uh, that uh, they do not fall into that appropriateness criteria, which we follow very religiously. Uh, and of course, that grid, which I showed you here, uh, is in every room, so that uh, everybody has been educated right from the, our fellows and nurse practitioners of attendings and uh, 
you name it. And no. therefore, any question case is, is discharge that, uh, you know, the patient is discharged and does not get a PCI and follow. And of course, many of the balloon rupture. Mm -hmm. There are many of these cases yeah, will, sure. now it will go. Yeah, as you saw it, the non-compliant balloon, uh, the, sorry, compliant balloon uh, of the uh, 2.520 apex ruptured at uh, 14 atmosphere because of this calcium. And now, since we are still dilated a part of it, our old uh, earlier, um, the quantum apex should go now. So, I mean, uh, what is contributing more, uh, more adherence to the appropriateness criteria or FFR? No, I would say kind of both. The, in the sense that most important is still becoming is the appropriateness. The FFR, just to show many of those cases which we used to do, uh, that uh, I was, and I think the I was really, uh, we learned that criteria of the IWAS are changing while FFR remains 0.8 uh, because the basically which uh, uh, IWAS criteria you should be using for PCI remains under a lot of skepticism and changes. And so that uh, the appropriateness is the more, uh, but to me, uh, and, uh, and that actually really, and, the, and I would also say that most of the time when there is a question, use FFR and go away from the uh, IWAS, because IWAS is really uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we'll do more PCIs in the intermediate lesion based on the IWAS, as I showed a few uh, um, yes, a month five, ago. Two five twelve high that pressure balloon. Anu, which balloon now? No, the, the same, the compliant quantum balloon is uh, quantum is not making, a, it's not reaching that area. But so what we are going to do is uh, take the guide liner, which okay. is made by the vascular solution, if you see it here, it's just... Uh, just the extension of the guide. The mother and daughter catheter. That's it. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, surgical volume, what is happening to cardiac surgery at Mount Sinai? Yeah, cardiac surgery actually from the cabbage point of view, the volume is still uh, continues to decline. So, the clearly the revascularization volume is overall decline both Mount Sinai, both nationally and I know for sure in the New York state. So, it's not that the more PCI, despite our syntax which we are following very religiously, knowing that now the data at four years, that the even balloon? the intermediate uh, risk patients, uh, that they do uh, the, that uh, syntax score of uh, 23 to 32, they do benefit uh, in terms of the surgical revascularization. Surgical volume has not increased. It's the overall revascularization volume has decreased. Uh, and uh, But what is happening with the surgery is that more patients with the aortic, because of the TAVI program and the mitral, knowing that the indication of the mitral valve surgery is shifting to the asymptomatic uh, patients more and more, so that clearly they are having a more aortic as well as the mitral uh, surgical volume. So that compensation overall, there is a growth of the surgical uh, volume at Mount Sinai, about 5% uh, compared to year before. So the clearly the more surgical procedures are being done at present, uh, but not from the cabbage so point of view. So if you can view. see how to get the guide liner into the vessel. So if you, I had just gone over the wire, the guide liner would not have gone in. So what you do is I went with the balloon and then got the guide liner advanced over the balloon. And that's the important point that you don't need to push guide liner too much. Yeah. Once guide liner everything comes will, there. Uh, everything otherwise will fly out. Yeah. So now you have the balloon. On the balloon, you <coughs> advance your guide liner. And you can do the same thing on the stent. The time you are putting a stent, guide liner has enough lumen, it will go over as long as you are careful uh, that you see the not the stent migrating. A uh, rare case could happen, but usually you will be able to advance guide liner on the stent, and then of course then you advance the stent further distally. So, I mean, more questions for you. What yeah. is happening with peripheral interventions and structural heart disease? Yeah, keep what? going. Peripheral but intervention continue to increase are... very significantly. At present, uh, we actually... Okay, now you see with that, uh, we are able to get the 2.5 balloon Excellent into the distal area. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a 2.5 yeah. uh, uh, quantum apex 12, right? So you're yes. going to leave the guide liner till you... Yeah, I will stay, uh, now it will stay there till we get deliver the stent. See why this is... See, now you see that, check. yeah, the, the so aim, the, in the beginning we decided probably we needed rotational atherectomy to that the area. Rupture. Yeah, but yeah. now Open. you needed three balloons. Yep. 18 atmosphere. Anu, you think you would have been able to get the rota burr there? Uh, yes, recently? yes. Okay. So this was the 2.5 uh, balloon? Yeah, 2.5 two five balloon five now quantum at 12, apex. quantum apex went up to 18. Now we have to make sure we just pre-dilate it really well. Again, same lesion preparation, good pre-dilatation before we 
think of uh, getting a strand down there. The guideliner is the key here uh, of this case, no? Yeah, it's, it's, well, I think very, it really it's a very helps important device, but uh, important is how to use it because if you just think that you are going to extend it over the wire, it will fly out. You need to have a so balloon a first. Balloon first, then and you then, come out. Yeah. Yeah, it very just goes very nice extension. Teaching point, yeah. yeah. Go up here. I mean, another uh, very interesting question for you. Uh, this is uh, somebody's mentioned. What do you think has been the most notable event in PCI in 2011? The total in occasions. Terms, in terms of the discovery, uh, the um, that actually, with, I would say that uh, clearly, as you know, that uh, the June symposium. I present. You can see a very nice. Uh, the present the most discovery. I definitely purposefully will keep that statement reserved. But yes, there have been a lot of uh, uh, the new things which have come in our field and uh, with my wait for the we top 10 advances. 28 there is, right? Yeah. No, uh, we, are, we, are, we are using uh, today the, uh, our same platinum chromium. Uh, they are 28. Chroma no? salimant. Chroma salimant 28? Yeah. 2.75? No. 2.75. 2.5? Yeah. No, 2.75. Okay. 2.75 and C, and then we, we, we will require three stents here. So this uh, is key about how you're pulling this out. This yeah. is really important. Can you show us that? Yeah. It's coming out. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But this is that uh, guideline. So the you guideliner just keep it stays in place yeah. and you're working you around yeah. it. Right. Sometimes you may see damp pressure, but we know that's because the guideliner is sitting in the vessel. Here, since uh, you know your RCA is such a large vessel, you don't see any damp pressure. And you are injecting with the guideliner being there. That's okay. Now it will give you some idea that in the proximal maybe there is dissection. No, it's a guideliner because yeah. dye Streaming. actually coming out of the guideliner and going back. And if you see how the guide, you know, don't do not touch the guide at this uh, level yeah. because uh, the way it is working, the guide is at the ostium, but the guideliner is helping us that it is behaving like an extension of the guide to the mid RCA. It's really important. So, I mean, Dr. Costa has asked you a question. Would you consider a transradial PCI to reduce uh, acute kidney injury because of less bleeding? I can tell you that overall you take most of the data of the transradial PCI, you will have a slightly higher contrast use, uh, although non-significant. But the bleeding, yes, bleeding point, but not necessarily for the kidney uh, injury. Uh, and maybe I can ask Roxana to make a comment on it, but definitely a uh, transradial. So there's never been a, a study that has shown that transradial actually reduces acute kidney injury. Or, I it mean, certainly reduces bleeding. Like, and and in fact, actually volume is slightly higher. And in fact, it's a little bit more. Okay, if, uh, if, uh, uh, Samir, if you see here. It's difficult to push it. If, huh? Yeah, but still, I think we have reached. You really have done it. You're guideline. almost there. Show the guideline now. Now if she can advance the, Anu is going to advance the guideliner, your stent is there, give you a little extra support. See that? You can see the guideliner is extending all the way down. <coughs> yeah. You think you are far enough for another millimeter or two? Uh, I think yeah. maybe she wants millimeter. to go in a little now more, I think. Good. Yeah. I think now we got it. In. Definitely. Okay. So take a but uh, the, the, that is how you do it. Means you get your stent down and then later on get your guideliner or the stent or the balloon so that you will be able to get your device where you want to. This is a 275 or Yes. Okay. 275, uh, uh, 28 go uh, platinum uh, chromium. Now remember this one, you can go compared to a uh, Zions, we never used to go beyond 12 atmosphere. Uh, actually now I go routinely 16 atmosphere with this so that you do not need to post dilate routinely because it is a very nice uh, radial strength. Ready? Well, we covered side. it or no? Let's see one second. Side. I think this is a very crucial point. Yeah, we have covered it. Yeah, okay. Let's yeah. see where we are now. Go to the last picture. We have to go beyond that uh, very large AV nodal um, uh, branch and somehow become very big. This, patient. this is exactly the same projection you are using? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I think you are beyond it. No. 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 Yeah. Let's see where you want to go are. wait? No. Yeah, you need yeah. a two millimeter more. Yeah, a little further. Yep. So maybe a little more deep throating with the guideliner. The guideliner, yeah. First thing now, right, you need is uh, your wire has wire. to go. And so the guideliner? Yeah. As, as promising as uh, you have been describing the Zions Prime, the Endeavor Resolute, and the Promise Element, uh, these tents have been available in many parts of the world for a long period of time. That's true. Yeah, take that a deep true. breath.
therefore, you know, America is a little slow, but you know, let uh, everybody else experiment things and uh, get to uh, the more advanced uh, designs and so. Yeah, but clearly, yes, that has been uh, we not only that to me. Yeah. Uh, the biggest issue was the size, length. I mean. I think we went. You got it. Yeah, you got now it. we you got did it. it. Now, particularly 38 millimeter. I mean, having so a the final thing that helped is uh, the guide liner, and uh, you see it at I'm um, moving forward. Patient takes a deep breath, and deep breath is also a very important feature uh, in interventional cardiology. Yeah, deep but breath is a cheap guide liner. I would say the deep breath is a cheap guide liner. And fellows know it. They. Try do and we say how come attending comes in and gets it in uh, less than uh, ten seconds. Yeah, nice. You select the stent for the middle Down. quickly now. Yeah, we got three minutes. five. Yeah, four oh even. This still could so be four. Yeah. Okay, three point five twenty eight. Okay. okay, good. Now sixteen atmosphere. And but ostium we didn't prep. Yeah, ostium we need. Um, the question is ostium. Do we need a four oh uh, flex stone followed by a, a four oh stent? And actually, you can expand the uh, the the promus element to almost 5.5 millimeter beyond one millimeter up to go can go up to 1.5. Okay. Yeah, because the ostium definitely yeah. is in the right. four, five yeah. to five range, no? Yep. Yes. Exactly five. Same five now, range. you see, you're it. not um, moving the guide liner; it sits there because we have another uh, job to complete. And then, when uh, we are doing the ostium, we take the guide liner out. So would uh, TAVI be the biggest uh, expectation coming in for uh, 2012 at Mount Sinai? Uh, well, I mean, for Sinai, absolutely all the same. That we did a first case in December. Uh, how so many, that uh, How many cases have you done now? Now, we actually 32. There was one case waiting now. That becomes 33. And uh, we so got few you're, approved. You are doing virtually a case a day? Uh, well, no. Well, ultimately, I would say I don't know whether you will have a 250 volume or uh, uh, in the future. Uh, but yes, uh, many of the centers uh, which uh, will go away, particularly when you go to the lower risk group, yeah, definitely that will start happening. But that's the second part of the core valve called SIRTAVI, the lower surgical risk with the between five to ten percent of uh, your STS mortality. You still not a very low, the medium. Take a picture. Get a four of um, flex to go yep. Okay, again, 16 atmosphere, you can see uh, that at 16, you don't need to go higher, but Down. 16 is good. I think you're good. You might just need inside the step. Yep. Mm. So, Samin, how much do you think no. is this going to change your strategy of uh, going back and dilating the with the non-compliant balloon? Well, I mean, with the, uh, with the Zions Prime and Zions, we were using almost that 70% uh, of yeah. the time post-dilatation. And now, uh, with the at present Promus, we just started a Promus element a few weeks ago. Uh, that uh, the use of the post dilatation in my practice uh, now has gone down to one third. So definitely has decreased. And just the, like it's not that uh, as we used to be with the uh, you know the days of the cipher, where that number was uh, basically 10, 15 percent. Maybe it will, but we just need to see. Well, the conformability yeah. looks very nice yeah. uh, in the stented segment. Uh, you know, you wonder, it has to be a combination of the platinum with the chromium, which has probably done the trick, because after all, platinum is nothing new to interventional cardiology. We discarded those tents uh, 15 years ago. Yeah, I, except that I think the portion, now you want to take the guideline out? No. Okay. I'll okay. get the, yeah, that, get the, this in and then take the guideline out. So, the portion, the platinum, uh, you know, percentage now in the, uh, platinum chromium being about 30 plus percent is the difference uh, only and that also gives the radio opacity. Anu, take a look in this particular view. Are you concerned with the ostium of the the very distal? Uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that is there, but uh, as long as it remains fine, uh, it's okay. Uh, but you're right. The, there is an issue in that um, uh, the, the AV nodal branch, which we are calling. So that's that, a pretty large yeah, branch, large uh, branch uh, providing yeah. collaterals to yeah. the... Then therefore, 40 flex stone will not go through the guideliner. Okay, mm -hmm. that has been said. Actually, 40 stent may not go through, through the, the six guide, French guideliner. Not six French. This is seven a seven already. French. Even seven French. Oh, even with the seven French. Okay. Three five sometimes gives us trouble. Yeah. 
Yeah. The, the, clearly, this will, we take the guide liner so out because you probably don't need now. Would you consider so. a 3.5 and then post dial it to a 4? No, but that's, don't need no, you can do it. You don't need the guide liner. Yeah, we don't need the guide Yeah, we don't need the guide liner now. Okay. Uh, we just have to quickly do the ostium and uh, finish the, our case. But clearly, it needs the ostium still need a little more work. So coming back to the point that yes, uh, that what you do in a large, uh, you don't need to go to a very large burr. You just go to a medium and small size, you know, medium size burr, and you do little eccentric cutting, and then. You do a, um, a flex tome or uh, angiosculpt in some cases, open up the ostium, and then you dilate. And the dilate basically, where will be the ostium? You put another wire into the aorta so that you know exactly where the ostium of the uh, RCA is for accurate pos positioning. Although you can use the Zebo technique, which we have shown actually in our symposium, but not now. Uh, but, you know, although the Zebo gets a little more complicated uh, sometimes, that uh, unless you are really crimped it and you need to pull it back for some region uh, that uh, it's, um, it's a little, uh, you know, stand may strip. So that overall, That's I think wire. if you just put a wire into the uh, sinus and uh, put on in the ostium, uh, your stent deployment will be good enough. Now this is a 4-0, a 6 flex stone. Okay. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. A little further. Yeah, pull back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go. Up. Good. Yeah. Down. Moved. Yeah, yeah, this will happen. Even those um, uh, in this short, um, uh, the um, in the angulated lesion, because of the angle, the things will move. That as long as you are careful, you pull back again. They have a four five time. strength. Four five. No, four o. Four o. No, they uh, have. Uh, no, with the, we don't, don't have, have four, four five. five. No, 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 four o. No, no, 4 0 18 or um, 16, and then we push dial it with a 5 0. Okay. Good. See, the, this is a nice one. At so now what you do is one, when you know you dilated the ostium, then you pull your guide out a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Down. Good. 16? Yeah. Then you want to post dial it? And then we'll dial it with a 5 0. Okay, now yeah. uh, come back here again. Good. Yeah. Okay. Now, other question, uh, thing also you need to be worried when you are doing multiple dilation of the, uh, with the cutting balloon at the calcific osteal RCA after uh, three uh, inflations likelihood that it could rupture. Yeah, 16, okay. Because remember the ostium is a little far away from exactly where it is coming from. And uh, this is a 4 uh, 16, and we'll dial it with a 5 0. Um, the non our non-compliant quantum apex 8 will be good enough. 5 8. No, no. 12. Or 15. 8 or 15. 15. Okay, 15. Go. And don't stick out too much, okay? Yeah. We'll put Before the wire the side strength. by side, no, yeah. No, no, no. We're not doing this. Do it like this. It looks good. Don't put all those wire in this. Okay. Now this is the key point. Now here. No, you want to go straight earlier. Yeah, I was wondering if you need to change to a more, yeah. more LAO. different view. Yes. Yeah, we are going to LAO yeah, or absolutely. even a caudal. Yeah, this was. See that? Yeah, this is a perfect view for it. Yeah. yeah. Take a no. picture. Yep. Yeah, okay. You want to go caudal? Yeah, picture. Oh, and a little more caudal. One more second caudal. before we take more a picture. Caudal. Bring this down. That's good. Okay, picture, picture yeah? Mm. Pack. yeah? Nice. You got to pull back a little, no? Yeah. No, it will be fine. You're good. Yeah. Ready? Yeah, yeah, go. Okay, now clearly once you start, then you start taking your guide out. Not yet, not yet. Yep. Otherwise, the stent will deploy in the guide and guide will take the stent out by itself. Good. good. Now. So now you give same you 16 atmosphere. Very nice demonstration. Of yes. But don't go high pressure because you feel the stick means inside. Means when you are at it, uh, 10, between 10 to 16, 12 atmosphere, 10. you just get your guide out. But it's very important, uh, like uh, either the stent will strip out or the okay, entire okay. Uh, mechanism will come out. So you have to be very careful oh, when you do that. Let's pull back a little bit. Yeah. And to, uh, so now you put the guide in. back in. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Ready? But here, uh, yeah, with this new uh, stents, you have to be very careful. 
Samin, important yes. question for you. What is safe? It's really go high pressure. What is the safe and maximal pressure of flexitome in the osteal RCA case? I would say the uh, safe eight, maximum twelve. If you need to go to high pressure, then you use angiosculpt, which you can go to sixteen to eighteen atmosphere. I I have also go found again. today's. Uh, uh, presentation more noteworthy because of the multitude of questions we've been getting all very relevant uh, making it truly now this is other thing that you could do Trump is when yeah is a flaring at the ostium what other view now okay. yeah but she want to go to high pressure yeah I'm no I'm using sure the high pressure flaring. but we are using the high pressure no, 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 time, time. Yeah. this is a very big vessel we go with the high pressure first now here clearly advancing the guide is very tricky because otherwise you may distort the ostium, uh, the stent which is a few millimeter out of the ostium anyway, so that that uh, you advance the guide yeah, on the balloon. Yeah, Beautiful. Good. Let's take it out. Then we do high pressure. Yeah. You want to take a picture or take a high no, pressure? No. High pressure. Yeah. Now, you know what I am trying to see uh, that from our educational uh, activities point of view that um, that maybe uh, in the end of presentation we will have a few questions like two of them or one question at least. One question and person who answers that online gets the some special prize. So, we have to work with the heart.org um, starting next year you know I always had to do something. So, in the end from the presentation will be a one question asked in the end and if the person first one to answer correctly will get some uh, uh, the special prize. Whether we can do it or not, that we need to see. The, we want to be within the compliance. Go. Okay. This is a 5-0, Anu. 5-0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 5-0 at 16 atmosphere. And most important is we need to do the ostium. <coughs> and clearly that, you know, you need to Show go. Show us again how you pull that out. Yeah, yeah. That's really a very good maneuver. Now I'm coming out with the guide because otherwise the balloon is not going to come out. See that? Right. Good. Now you know now you it is in the it there. Yeah. As you go up. up. Good. Now you pull uh, it out. Uh, so nice. See that? Yeah. Now, Very nice. You need to put a few more millimeter out. She's going to, yeah. And then you trump it. Mm. The flaring or whatever you call it. Why are you doing this in the time? Okay. That's good. 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 Nice. Ready? Yes. Okay. Now. Now clearly the, the balloon may come back, but that's okay. That's that if so it is, then you see, you go with your guide, you butt at again. the balloon, and then you go down, you pull up. So, I mean, at Genesis. this moment, yes. in this particular last inflation, you think the proximal down. portion is uh, slightly outside the struts? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And we want that. So you're you see that compliance of the balloon telling you, because the stent, the area is yeah, not, uh, once it is out, it is fully expanded, that area. So, clearly that you can see based on there that a few millimeter has to be out. That's the only way you can flare the ostium. We go back to our same view, which we have done all the work. We take a picture and I think we are reaching to the time and then we'll see. Ready? Get some nitro or no? Take a picture. Yeah, we'll do. Beautiful. Good. If everything is okay, I think we are reaching to our time. Few millimeter, few minutes extra, about eight minutes. But part of that is because of the complex case, and this is what we really wanted to show and demonstrate. And uh, come back to our uh, last two, our take-home messages. I mean, uh, before that, how much is the total contrast volume you used? Total contrast volume. One twenty. One twenty. Okay. 120. Well, clearly, with the seven French, we'll use little extra anyway. So that's the issue. So okay. therefore. I think if we, we sum it up, uh, the two uh, again, uh, the important points that the newer third generation DES seems to perform better in terms of delivery, lower malapposition, better radial strength, and uh, similar lower stent thrombosis rate and MI as of second generation DES. So the very, very important point, the third generation stent, I think, will make away or uh, neutralize some of the drawback of the second generation being a thin strut. Second, when very important, that the preferred choice of a contrast media for prevention of uh, kidney injury or CIN has not yet been settled. As obvious by 2011 ACC guidelines. So clearly that anybody wants to make a claim 
we may feel differently but that is what the official statement is no contrast is superior the and, and that's a good news overall i would say for the media so that clearly the from cost point of view becomes better for everyone then one what i can say and i can based on the scientific uh, evidence that the iopamidol appears to have the edge over other low as well as isosmolar contrast agent in terms of reducing aki but more importantly lower long term base there is no data in the literature what you have the one year follow up the care showing that what happens to these patients at one year and clearly seems to be that it is not just that those who develop events and so but the key is that it's the contrast because always question was the is it only the contrast in nephropathy or it's the contrast agent which have a bad out, adverse outcome and i can say that there was 70% of patients to the 450 means 280 patients which were followed one year in the care trial is the largest of the long term follow up to answer that question that yes it is clearly contrast mediated it is a, a acute kidney inju- uh, injury caused by contrast at the same time iopamidol seems to have a lower major adverse event at follow up with that note anu you make your last statement and uh, we call for the day yes i think uh, here a uh, demonstration of, of technical point of view is how you handle uh, the osteal rca if you see you know calcific osteal rca whether you are using a cutting balloon or you are using rotation laterectomy i think we have shown both of them and uh, for the uh, you know the distal vessel intervention uh, be it uh, calcific lad rca or circumflex uh, even when sometimes uh, you know the take off of the circumflex is more than 90 degree this uh, use of guideliner has uh, really helped us uh, to deliver uh, the devices uh, to, to the distal area as demonstrated here that we were able to get without double wire in the past we have shown that uh, the other way to do that is uh, use double wire sometimes uh, uh, maybe even three wires but with the help of the guideliner we are able to deliver uh, the distal uh, you know stent uh, in this kind of a tough case Anu, we see your entire team. You want to show us uh, who else is behind you? Uh, I, I mean, uh, this kind of cases we do every day, and who normally help us, our international fellow. I have a uh, John Odia who actually is uh, visiting us uh, from Ireland. He finished his uh, MD in Ireland. Uh, they have, you know, they do three years of research, and he wanted to come to Sinai. He specially selected Sinai to get uh, overall uh, experience uh, in every aspect, uh, peripheral. Uh, of uh, interventional uh, do complex cases so that when he goes back uh, he uh, is fully trained and i think after this year he has uh, he wants to do one more year of uh, um, even uh, the valvular diseases and then he'll be going back to ireland but uh, the important thing for us is to run this busy lab other than the help of the nurses uh, technicians uh, uh, we call our interventional fellows as our uh, backbone means they have everything uh, ready for us uh, otherwise this case this complex case uh, in a normal day we do it just with the interventional uh, uh, fellows help and, and here we have wiki uh, i am sure most of our webcast have been done uh, with the and of course uh, derek uh, and pablo being the card of cbt um, and uh, the you know rest of our camera crew and here um, and clearly um, uh, that i will just uh, make a last statement or i'll ask uh, to finish today's uh, with the uh, asking uh, roxana that any future uh, about a non iron non iodinated contrast will be using ever in uh, our pci uh, hopefully that may eliminate or there, is there any theory uh, behind or uh, uh, about uh, uh, those agents uh, coming down the pike so i think the quest now is on finding a contrast media that's actually safe for the kidneys and maybe even bypasses the kidneys for clearance this is really the quest for the future uh i think that uh you know it's very difficult for us to perform our studies without contrast media but the question is how can we find the the safest contrast media to to deliver and the most important thing here i think the message given where we are today as you already discussed is in really understanding our patient's risk factors minimizing the the load of contrast and preparing the patient for this kind of a uh, uh, an insult but the future is going to be uh looking for contrast media that actually avoid 
kidney for clearance. And I'll tell you, it's interesting that you ask that because there are a couple of actually small biotech companies that are working on this. So it would yep. be very interesting to take a look at that. And knowing that in the guidelines, besides hydration, the very much emphasis on decreasing the contrast use uh, during your PCI. And therefore, maybe uh, Anu can sum it up uh, today's uh, presentation because this is such a hot topic for everybody uh, that what can you do by decreasing the, the minimizer, uh, the contrast material, uh, and actually uh, during the PCI. Uh, now, actually, I have one more person to introduce, uh, my nurse practitioner, Antoinette, who has been uh, all the time helping, uh, and of course, uh, Take the, mask yeah, mask, the mask is the off is allowed. Uh, and uh, with that note, uh, Anu, you want to give some more tips? Yeah. Uh, the, I think for the interventionist of the various, uh, um, you know, cause for uh, um, kidney CIN or uh, acute kidney injury, which is shown by Dr. Sharma, I think what we believe is patient preparation. And a lot of it is not in our hands. Um, uh, you can say 30 to 40 percent of the patients already uh, have heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, and uh, along with that, they come with the creatinine, which we are talking about 1.9 or 1.9 to 2.1. There's no way. You can hydrate as when their EF is usually in the 30 range. So give minimal hydration. If your EF is normal, I always tell uh, the nurses, they know that uh, hydrate them before, which uh, could be three hours. Just give good hydration. And when they're preparing the patient, give a bolus anywhere between 300 to uh, 400 cc bolus and the most important for us which our fellows know that the volume of the dye has to be very low uh, in a, even in acute MI setting or in a, you know this kind of renal insufficiency patient never go beyond three digits you have to stop between 70 to 80 cc dye uh, that would be uh, that is the key thing I think for us interventionalists that uh, we can do to avoid uh, this uh, uh, important complication. And particularly in this particular case, we knew you this one will require 100 plus. You know, it had to go to three digits. This kind of complex case, and that is one of the reasons also we gave enough time for kidney to recover. Actually, creatinine today was lower than when she had it to a PCI back in mid-October. Uh, and having said that, maybe uh, the again, uh, finish it, uh, uh, the last one, that what about do you believe in sodium bicarbonate? I know. I personally do not believe in sodium bicarbonate. I think uh, our uh, cardiac patients, unless they have a normal blood pressure and normal EF, you, we cannot use them in cardiac patient because most of them have a risk factor of hypertension. The sodium load we give, they become hypertensive waiting outside. And uh, EF, if we are talking EF of anywhere 45 and less, as soon as you give uh, couple of cc's of soda bicarb, I see the nurse or the nurse practitioner calling me, the patient is coughing. And we've had this experience a lot, and uh, I think I personally don't believe just uh, hydration and uh, decrease your uh, dive uh, load would be the best way to prevent this complication. And starting the next year, you know, always we try to work a few things. Uh, one which we are adding to our the live webcast is adding the endovascular, as you uh, saw the interest by the of uh, our um, viewers and so seeing an endovascular case. So Prakash Krishnan uh, with uh, uh, Jose Wiley and uh, George Dangas uh, being a moderator. Uh, we'll start uh, having an endovascular case once a month, one particular Wednesday. I think it will be a second, uh, uh, sorry, second or fourth Wednesday of the month uh, will be starting edge of next month. And idea is towards end of next year, that um, mid next year and later, that we'll start a one dedicated day per month also for a structural heart disease and uh, performing uh, percutaneous um, our uh, percutaneous aortic valve and other um, structural heart disease um, uh, webcast so that we continue to grow and i really uh, thank all uh, our um, one uh, heart.org and medscape as well as our viewers who have been a great strength and keep stimulating me coming up with uh, some new ideas and making slides uh, until the last minute but i took the pledge and I was here right just one minute late. Starting next year, even that won't happen. That will start in time, but provide the latest data unbiased on this, many of these controversial topics and uh, push the field further. And uh, this is clearly shown by the enthusiasm that anywhere between three to 5,000 web hits per month, cumulative web hits, knowing that uh, acutely probably about uh, live 800 to 1,000, uh, but more overall, three to 5,000 plus uh, web hits has been a very satisfying uh, 
uh, experience for my myself, for Annu, and I would say the rest of our Cat Lab team. Samin, congratulations to you. Happy holidays to your team as well as to our viewers. Uh, it has been a fantastic year, a great progress, excellent cases, uh, uh, demonstrating uh, all the fine tips and tricks in an unbiased atmosphere. My congratulations to you. Uh, happy holidays again to everybody. We'll see you back next time, January 17th.